Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Otem, and today we'll talk about the Christmas hit from the 16th century, Gaudete. If you are an enthusiastic choir singer, you might know the Christmas carol Gaudete. This very fun song had many interesting arrangements in the Renaissance, but it also had a surprising comeback in the 20th century. In this episode, we will look into how this song was set, how it was changed over the years, and how it ended up the way it did in the 20th century. Let's start. Gaudete is found in a well-known collection from 1582 entitled Pie Canciones, compiled by a Finnish student called Diedrich Petri while he was studying in Rostock, Germany. It includes anonymous school and devotional songs in Latin. Some of the songs are of Swedish and Finnish origin, dating back to different periods, some as far back as the 11th century. While Gaudete might be based on an old melody, its four-voice setting in Pie Canciones reflects 16th century techniques. It seems to be a refrain intended to be sung in between four verses of text, for which, sadly, and unusually for the source, no music is given. As a start, then, we will focus on this four-voice refrain. Here is a modern transcription of it. The text translates as Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is born of the Virgin Mary, rejoice. In case you don't know it, it sounds more or less like this. We will sing it lower for our convenience. Gaudete, gaudete, Christus est natus, ex Maria Virgine, gaudete. This seems to be a polyphonic arrangement of the melody found in the tenor line. Apart from the fact that it was a common procedure to base polyphonic texture on a melody in the tenor, we can also find this melody on its own in some earlier sources. Here it is set as a hymn with a German text from a 1544 source, to be sung after the meal. It is notated in A, one note higher than the way it is notated in the Pie Canciones. The melody is found in yet another source from Germany, but this time in Latin. There are also two polyphonic settings of this melody from 1534 by the Swiss composer Ludwig Zenfel. These are quite special. Here is the first one. We'll sing the melody and play the rest of the voices on the harpsichord. And here is the second one with yet another text. It's quite astonishing how different the same melody can sound with different treatments. Four years later, in 1538, we find yet another four-part setting, in a book about the Latin language by the German theologist Johann Spangenberg. Aside from the fact that it is set again in A instead of G, it is very similar to our Gaudete from 1582. We will return to this older version, but first let's try to create a four-voice setting based on the tenor melody ourselves. We'll do it by using a simple formula, used in the 16th century both by composers and improvisers. So, we have our melody in the tenor, and we want to add more voices. An ingenious technique suggests the following procedure. Excluding the first and last notes that should be a perfect consonance, a voice above follows the melody in parallel sixths. 
To this, we add a voice below, which alternates between thirds and fifths. I'll play it for you on the harpsichord. Using this technique until the end, we are forced to introduce some E flats and find it difficult to reach the F sharp, which would be expected at the cadence. It is possibly for this reason that our colleagues from the 16th century broke away from the model and arranged the cadence differently. And now, following this technique further, we can also add a fourth voice, an alto. This voice should also be above the melody and should alternate between thirds and fourths above the tenor melody. At the end, since the model was broken to make a better cadence, we have to find our way by using different consonances. This is how they completed it in 1582. Since they used a B flat over the E in the bass, we are forced to add a flat there. Let's hear the final outcome. Having created our own version almost entirely by ourselves, we can compare it with the early version from 1538. Apart from having different text and being in A, a tone higher, it is very similar. The soprano and bass are practically identical, using the same intervallic scheme. The alto, however, is different. Apart from making parallel fits with the bass, which are most likely an unintended error, the alto line in this setting also makes parallel fourths with the melody. This gives a beautiful color that might have been considered old-fashioned by the time of the 1582 version. It is not clear, therefore, whether the later version simply copied the older version, transposed it, and corrected and updated its alto line, or whether, in both cases, the creators followed the same technique when harmonizing the same melody, and thus ended up with very similar results. Both options seem possible. We should briefly touch on the subject of musica ficta. Up till now, we only added a sharp at the cadence, and an E flat to avoid a bad interval. As we mentioned in our episode dedicated to the subject, one way to learn about the application of musica ficta is from other sources containing the same piece. Especially informative are instrumental arrangements, which often show the explicit keys or strings that should be struck. In this case, we have an organ tablature arrangement of the piece in its Lutheran version. It was published in 1571, 12 years before Pie Canciones, by the German organist Elias Nikolaus Ammerbach. As you can see and hear, Despite the little ornaments and the typical loss of clear contrapuntal information found in such intabulations, the piece sounds more or less how we expect in terms of musica ficta. The only difference is that in this version there is no need to flatten the E, and that the F in the final cadence is explicitly sharpened. However, in the second and extended edition of Pie Canciones from 1625, we see a lot of notated musica ficta. All the Fs in the top line are sharpened. The E flat in the bass is now explicitly written, and there is even one raised note in the tenor melody. Is this also the way it was supposed to be performed in 1582? After all, in the entire edition, there are no sharp accidentals whatsoever. We can't know for sure. 
It could even be that the taste for additional musica ficta grew with the years, or was simply subjected to individual preference. Otherwise, there are further German vocal settings of this melody, but we should probably skip them for now. If you are interested, you can find them in the footnotes page. While some of the songs and texts found in Pie Canciones were republished through the centuries, our beloved Gaudete only resurfaced again in 1910, in a new and revised edition of the Pie Canciones commissioned by the Plain Song and Medieval Music Society in England. Let's see. The editor of this new edition, G. R. Woodward, explains. The original volume might have been easily reproduced in facsimile, but if the book was to be of any practical use, and possible to be used in choirs and places where they sing, it was necessary that the old work should appear in a new shape. This is for three main reasons. One, the original notation is often inaccurate, and the text placement is unclear. Two, the old clefs are hard to read for some. But most importantly, three, the original contained a toleration of certain grave doctrinal errors. That is, the original creators from 1582 altered some of the old texts in a way which was unacceptable to the Anglican priest Woodward in 1910, so he had to revise it. As researchers, we can definitely see the first two points as a reason to make a new edition of an old source. But the last point shows that Woodward wanted to make an edition that would be useful for him religiously, even at the cost of altering the source. Interestingly, while he altered the 1582 texts freely, it was important for him to preserve the old look graphically. The ancient 16th century notation has been retained, as being more artistic than the modern style of the 20th century founts and as being more in keeping with the old-fashioned music book such as this. Now, let's see how he presents our beloved Gaudete. He uses old-looking note shapes, but puts them in a modern little score. On the one hand, adhering to the source, but on the other, changing it to make it more accessible, is something that musicologists regularly have to deal with when making editions. Anyway, as you can see, his edition seems to represent only the 1582 publication, which did not include any musica ficta. If a new critical edition of this song were to be made nowadays, the editor would surely collate, or at least mention, the second edition from 1625 with all its added musica ficta. I don't know why Woodward ignored it, perhaps he did not have it. But regardless, the way he presented this song dictated the way it was performed throughout the 20th century and until today. In a parallel universe in which Woodward did include the extra accidentals, our Gaudete would have sounded like that. Gaudete, Gaudete, Christus est natus, ex Maria Virgine Gaudete. Finally, let's talk about the missing music of the verse texts. Woodward admitted that he is not sure why no music was supplied for the verses. Based on the fact that there is another song in the collection that starts with the same two words as the first verse of Gaudete, which also contains the necessary number of syllables, he suggested that one could use the same melody for this purpose. We'll sing for you the first verse of Gaudete with this melody. Tempus ad esgratiae hoc vod octabamus, carmina letitiae devote retamus. The main question now is how does it fit modally, as this tune is in another mode? And what about the rest of the melody? In any case, to my knowledge, and possibly for these reasons, no one has used this melody for the verses. The next time someone suggested a melody for the verse, as far as I can tell, was in 1966, when scholar and musician David Wollstone recorded the piece with his group, the Clerks of Oxenford. He, naturally, had to come up with some music for the verse. Let's listen.
I don't know where he found this melody, but two years later he published an edition of Gaudete with another one. In the commentary, he only tells us that the melody is taken from a manuscript from Prague, without explaining how and why. Here are the two versions side by side, adjusted to G, the original key of Gaudete. This might suggest that he was unhappy with the first melody he chose for some reason. Perhaps he considered the second one more musicologically legitimate for publication? The refrain in Wollstone edition is set in A, a tone above the original, and like in Woodward's edition from half a century before, there is no mention of any additional accidentals, historical or editorial. The huge comeback of the piece arrived a few years later, when in 1972 the British folk rock band Steel Eye Span recorded it and made it one of the few a cappella performances in Latin to ever become a hit single. They somehow rearranged the setting to fit their voices and made some adjustments to Wollstone's melody from his 1966 performance. <laughs> Following Still I Span's success with this song, countless performances and arrangements of Gaudete followed using their verse melody. Some were very influential, like the arrangement made for the King's Singers in 1989. It was only in 1992, in the New Oxford Book of Carols, that the background of Wollstone's more musicological verse was explained. Based on a clue left by Woodward in 1910, that the third verse of Gaudete is found as the first verse of another song in a couple of 15th century Czech manuscripts, they found the melody of that song and used it as the verse of Gaudete. There is of course the question of how to connect it to the refrain modally, but this is how it sounds when fitted with the verse text of Gaudete. Tempus ades gratiae hoc vod octabamus Carmina Letizie devote retamus Gaudete Check the footnotes if you are interested in the details. The editors of this edition noted that the verse tune is very close to that which is sung today. But as you see in this comparison, where I just transposed the melodies to be on the same key in relation to the refrain, only the ending is similar. The refrain itself, albeit transposed a tone up, is copied from the first edition, again without mentioning the musica ficta of the second edition. It's of course okay to prefer it without the ficta, but a mention would have been nice. Going back to the music of the verse, while most performances out there simply follow the Steel I Span version, the piece was also recorded several times by dedicated early music groups, who occasionally used different melodies. I had assumed that their versions were based on concrete sources, but three directors who recorded the piece told me that facing this gap, they created something on their own that they felt was appropriate stylistically. After all this, when you perform Gaudete today, you know what kind of options you have. Some are more historically justified than others, but any choice can be a good choice if you do it consciously and honestly with your audience. This was our episode about the famous Gaudete, we hope you enjoyed it. Many thanks to Doron and Ivo for singing with me the examples. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.